Hi everyone, the topic of today is geodesics. These are curves in a Riemannian manifold that minimize the energy and length. Incredibly important in geometry, physics and dynamics. We will go straight to the definition. We say that a smooth curve in a Riemannian manifold M is a geodesic if the covariant derivative of its velocity is zero. It may feel a little unmotivated, but let's see what this means in the Euclidean space. In Rn, the covariant derivative is just the usual derivative, and this condition translates as having zero second derivative. In other words, in Rn, a geodesic is a curve with zero acceleration, which is nothing more than a straight line parameterized with constant speed. Geodesics in general have constant speed. To check that, we first know that if we have two vector fields along a curve, the derivative of the inner product satisfies the Leibniz rule, provided the connection is compatible with the metric, which we always assume when we are working with a Riemannian manifold. To see that, we write v and w in local coordinates, expand the expression of the inner product using the bilinearity, and then use the standard Leibniz rule. Here we use the fact that the connection is compatible with the metric, and after that we use the bilinearity again to push the coefficients back inside the inner product, getting what we wanted to show. Now we are ready to show that geodesics always have constant speed. To see that, we just take the derivative of the speed squared and apply the Leibniz rule. By definition of geodesic, the covariant derivative we get here is zero. Now we will use local coordinates to turn the definition of geodesic into a nice differential equation. Take a curve gamma with coordinates x1, x2, and so on. Its velocity has components x1 dot, x2 dot, and so on. And when we take the covariant derivative of this, we can turn it into an expression involving the coordinates, their derivatives, their second derivatives, and the Christoffel symbols. Equating this to zero corresponds to a second-order ordinary differential equation we call the geodesic equation. We can now apply the standard trick of introducing more variables to turn this second-order equation into a first-order equation. What we do is introduce the variables v1, v2, and so on, and force them to be the derivatives of the variables x1, x2, and so on. Then the second derivatives of the xi's are the first derivatives of the vi's, and we get this first order equation of two n variables. Since the Christoffel symbols are smooth, for any initial condition there is a unique solution for at least a short amount of time. This means that for any initial position p and any initial velocity v in tpm, there is a unique geodesic we call gamma v that passes through p and has velocity v at time zero. The domain of this geodesic can be potentially very small, but we will worry about that in a later lesson. For now, we will just use the fact that it exists and it is unique. From now on, we will work with the tangent bundle. Recall that a chart phi of m introducing local coordinates in a region u provides also a chart psi of the tangent bundle, introducing local coordinates in the preimage of u. On these coordinates, we can write a vector field g on the tangent bundle having this expression. Notice that the vector field g corresponds to the geodesic equation we obtained earlier. This means that a curve on Tm is a flow line of g, or a solution to this equation, if and only if it is of the form gamma prime of t with gamma geodesic. This shows that the vector field g does not depend on the chart that we are using, and we call it the geodesic vector field. We then take the flow of the vector field g around the zero vector at a point p of our manifold. This means there is an open set u around p, a positive epsilon, a positive time t0, and a smooth map phi from the set of vectors v tangent to the manifold at u having length less than epsilon times the interval minus t0 t0 to tm with phi v t equal to gamma v prime of t. This flow will be even more useful after we prove the homogeneity property of geodesics, but we first need a chain rule for the covariant derivative. If we have a curve gamma, a vector field v along gamma, and a reparameterization phi, then we can relate the covariant derivative along gamma to the covariant derivative along the reparameterization. Let's call the reparameterization alpha and denote the covariant derivatives along alpha and gamma by d alpha and d gamma respectively. Then v, composed with phi, is going to be a vector field along alpha, and its covariant derivative coincides with the covariant derivative of v along gamma times phi prime. You can check this identity by first verifying it for coordinate vector fields, and then using the Leibniz rule to get it in general. 
Using this chain rule, we now prove one of the most important properties of geodesics. If we have a geodesic gamma v defined on an interval minus t0 t0, then for any positive s, the geodesic gamma sv is defined on the interval minus t0 over s, t0 over s, and gamma sv at t coincides with gamma v at st. This means that if we change the speed in which we travel along a geodesic, it remains a geodesic as long as we travel by constant speed. To prove that, let alpha be the curve gamma v of st. We will show that alpha equals gamma sv by proving that it is a geodesic. By the classic chain rule, alpha prime equals s gamma v prime at time st. By the chain rule for covariant derivatives, the covariant derivative of alpha prime along alpha is s squared times the covariant derivative of gamma v prime along gamma v. Since gamma v is a geodesic, this is zero, so alpha is also a geodesic. Since the initial velocity was s times gamma v prime of zero, it equals sv. This shows that alpha equals gamma sv, proving the proposition. Now we go back to the flow of the geodesic vector field. Let delta be epsilon times t0 over 2, and define a map psi from the set of vectors of length less than delta, tangent to the manifold that u times the interval minus 2, 2 to m, as psi of vt equal to the base point of phi of 2v over t0, comma t t0 over 2. This is a smooth map, and it is well defined because 2v over t0 has norm less than epsilon, and t t0 over 2 has absolute value less than t0. Now remember that phi had an expression in terms of geodesics. This equals the base point of gamma 2v over t0 prime at the time t t0 over 2. This is a rather complicated expression, but by the homogeneity property, this is nothing more than gamma v at time t. The homogeneity property allowed us to extend the time of definition from minus t0 t0 to minus 2 2 at the expense of working with vectors of smaller length. If we wanted to, we could have done the opposite. Work with arbitrarily long vectors at the expense of flowing only for a very short time. We will use this map psi to define the exponential map at p. The exponential map at p is a function from the ball of radius delta in the tangent plane tpm to m, given by the formula gamma v of 1. We know it is smooth because it coincides with psi of v1, which depends smoothly on v. For each line passing through the origin in tpm, the exponential map sends it to the geodesic in m with that same direction. We now show that the inverse of the exponential map is a chart after maybe restricting it to a smaller ball. This will be a consequence of the inverse function theorem. Notice that we can identify the tangent space to the tangent space at the origin with the tangent space itself. This is because every vector space can be naturally identified with its own tangent spaces by using lines. For each v in this tangent space, we compute the derivative of the exponential map applied to v. This corresponds to the curve given by the exponential map applied to the line tv. By the homogeneity lemma, this is nothing more than gamma v. The velocity of gamma v at time zero is precisely v, so the derivative of the exponential map is the identity. In particular, it is invertible. And by the inverse function theorem, after maybe shrinking the domain, the exponential map is going to be a diffeomorphism near zero. Now we are going to introduce a very convenient set of coordinates. Pick an orthonormal basis E1, E2, and so on in TPM, and use it to put local coordinates around p via the exponential map. These coordinates are called normal coordinates around p. We finish this lesson by proving some properties of this chart. At zero, the metric coefficients are the Kronecker delta, the Christoffel symbols are zero, and the derivatives of the metric coefficients are also zero. The proof is quite simple. The first item just follows from the fact that we chose the basis to be orthonormal from the very beginning, so there is nothing to show. To get the second one, notice that the coordinate lines passing through the origin represent geodesics, so the covariant derivative nabla partial i partial i is zero along this line. Same if we fix indices i and j. 
when we take the line in the direction EI plus EJ, this is again a geodesic. So nabla partial I plus partial J, partial I plus partial J is also zero at zero. We can expand this expression and use the fact that nabla partial I partial I and nabla partial J partial J are also zero at zero to get what we wanted to show. Now that we have the second item, the third one just follows from the fact that the connection is compatible with the metric. We expand, cancel, and we're done. This finishes the proof of the proposition, and this is the end of the video. Next time, we will show that if there is a shortest curve connecting two points in a Riemannian manifold, then that curve is a geodesic. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.